right, I'm in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to begin in verse 17. This is where I was at in the at the end of the previous message. In verse 17, Paul said that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And that this is really about the knowledge of God. The context of this, of course, can be better placed from verse 15, where he, he speaks about the love of of the Ephesians, where he has said that he has heard of the love that is being expressed by the Ephesians, and that this is good, you know, this is worth talking about, this is worth knowing, and it is something to be appreciated. When when there, when there is a person who expresses love towards someone else, especially a manifestation of the love of God, then this is something to definitely speak of. But what he says is that, well, you know, I've heard of this, but this is what I'm going to pray for. Okay, so, you know, a lot of people will will kind of take the, the position or the posture that the objective is love, and, and that is very far away from the objective. The real objective, the real purpose that which God is genuinely interested in is what Paul prays for. He continues, let me, let me start from, from verse 15 again to show you how this blends in with verse 17. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And this is what he prays for. Verse 18. The eyes of, oh, I'm sorry, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, but not just the spirit of wisdom and revelation. You know, I'm, I'm, that, that, sounds, that sounds kind of open-ended, right? I mean, specifically, the wisdom and revelation of what? Of the knowledge of of your God, of knowing your God. He prays that they may know their God, that this may be a part of or expressed as the wisdom and revelation, that God may give you wisdom and revelation in the context of who he is. Okay, this is what this is what he gets into from uh, from verse 15 from verse 17, verse 15 to verse 17. Okay, so that's that's where I was I was ending in the previous message. Let me go ahead and press forward a little bit. Now, when it comes to the knowledge of God, okay, and I did mention this just briefly in the previous message. When it comes to the knowledge of God, of knowing Him, I want you to understand that there can be a profound difference between what I like to call the academic exercise and the relationship, okay? There's a profound difference between the academic exercise and the relationship, okay? And this is what I mean. What I mean is that you can approach the scriptures, you can approach the study of God, known as theology. You can approach both both of those things from the point of view of an academic exercise, all right, where you just study things, you outline things, you break them down into the smallest detail, you look at the grammatical structure of every word that's present there from, you know, from, from within the original language of the manuscripts that we have at our disposal. I mean, there is a lot of opportunity to approach the scriptures from the perspective of an academic exercise and to study all the people have have written about before and to listen to all the sermons that are relevant to you know a specific passage or topic all right this can be an academic exercise now i do not want to say that this is not worth doing okay i don't want to say that i'm just saying that there is a difference okay I, I would like to encourage, you know, encourage you, if you feel inspired or motivated to go through the scriptures from that perspective as an academic exercise, then by all means do that. You know, I have done that. I do that on occasion. I'm not going to say that there's anything evil about that. 
I'm just saying that there is a difference. There's something else that I want you to consider and I want you to get in touch with. All right. Now, you know, I personally, I know academic exercises, you know, years ago uh, from from the date that I'm recording this, I used to teach in a university and, and I loved it. You know, sometimes I think about going back just because I miss it. And, and the courses that I taught were among the high, some, some, I did teach a few lower level courses, but, but most of them were of the higher level courses uh, that very few students would ever make it to, you know, and the topics that I spoke on were, were, were very complex, very difficult to understand. And the, at the school that I taught, some of the, some of the, uh, the things that I, that I did present, some of the, the courses that I presented were courses that, that are so involved that they're not even really offered at other universities. So, you know, I know what it is to go through an academic exercise, you know, to go to go through a textbook, just to give you an example, to pick up a textbook on a certain topic and go through it carefully and construct assignments, lectures, tests, you know, and, and to grade all that kind of stuff. I know what that is. I have done that many times. So I can, you know, I can approach the scriptures in the same way. And like I said, on occasion, I will do that, but I will do that with a complete, you know, open-minded, uh, sense of open-minded, sober-minded reality that I know that that's exactly what I'm doing. And I understand the limitations and the advantages. You know, I'm, I'm not going to say it's not worth doing. But I can tell you that there is a distinct difference. The main difference, all right, the easiest difference to say is that, you know, I've picked up a lot of textbooks. You know, I've, I've a lot of textbooks and and I've and I've and I've constructed courses from those textbooks. I've, I've done this many times, but at no time throughout any of my lectures or through any of the assignments or exams did I ever ask any of the students, what can you tell me about the author? You know, I mean, what can you tell me? Most people don't even know who the you know, what the name of the author is, especially after after a while of reading through the book, they're not interested in the author. They're, they're trying to figure out certain content from the pages within it. They, they don't even think about who wrote this thing or even who published it. They don't care, which is fine, you know, but I don't ask them, what can you tell me about the person who wrote this? You know, what's, what's important to him, right? What are some of his life objectives? What are the things that this person values? What is this person thinking about doing in the future? You know, I, I don't ask those kind of questions. You don't ask those kind of questions. But with the Bible, you know, with the scriptures, this is important, all right? We want to know the person who we could say wrote the scriptures as it was inspired by him. I have to sneeze in just a moment, I think. Um, don't be too surprised. If I could just redo this recording, I would. I just turn it off, but I'm going to go ahead and sneeze. <laughs> sneeze there. There we go. Get it out. Okay. We don't, we don't go through the scriptures for the purpose, uh, you know, of, of just, of just understanding and knowing the scriptures just in and of themselves and the, and, and the details and the content and, and all the intricacies of everything that's there. We want to know the person of our God who is testified of in the scriptures all right. And of course, I do believe that the scriptures were divinely inspired by him and that he definitely participated in the recording and the writing of what we have. I have lots of examples that I can point to that gives me the absolute conviction concerning that. But for the most part, you know, most of the time when I approach the scriptures, I'm approaching them from the perspective of of this is a, the testimony of my God. And I am studying this so that I might know him as a person, okay? So just as we could say, you know, the objective of the Christian life is not to just go and love other people. Well, you know, it's a wonderful thing, but that just really isn't it. The objective of the Christian life is more closely connected to knowing the God who has saved us and who we will spend all of eternity with, all right? And in the world that we are a part of right now, we have opportunities to get to know him in ways that we will not easily, if, if at all, be able to get to know him when we are with him in the kingdom of heaven. The environment is different. The circumstance is different. I mean, you don't have any struggles, not the kinds of struggles that we have in the world that we're a part of. And these are fantastic opportunities 
to get to know our God as a person, especially as he walks through the struggles and challenges and difficulties of life with us, you know, which is what he does. Okay, so that, that was the first thing that I really wanted to present. I really wanted to bring up in the context of verse 17, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. All right, that you're wanting to know him as a person. Okay, now I, I, I cannot just tell you, uh, so you know, I can't just tell you how you can know him as a person. I can't just tell you that to the satisfaction that it will be real. Uh, that's, that's a little bit of an awkward way of saying that there are some limits, right? Let me just say it that way. There are some distinct limits concerning how I can contribute to your faith and your life, okay? This is one thing that I can do. I can testify of him. I can tell you about him. I can do that. And that's worth listening to, all right? It is, you know, to, 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 it's worth listening to testimonies about him, what other people may be able to share concerning what they know and what they believe. I think that's wonderful, you know, and I'd like to encourage you to do that more if you're not already putting a good amount of time in your life to pursuing that. But there's a big difference, all right? There's a big difference between the testimony of someone else and his own testimony about himself. Okay, I'll say that again, just like there's a big difference between an academic exercise and getting to know a person. There's a big difference between the testimony of another person and the testimony of that person themselves. Okay, there's a big difference between the two. Now, of course, you could think about how that can work in the world. And there have been some occasions when I have mentioned to people, well, you know, yeah, I could say a lot about me, but why don't you go for an ex just to give you an example, why don't you go to the Living God Ministries website and on there you'll see a tab that says recent testimonials. Why don't you spend some time reading through those and see what other people have testified about me and about how I've been able to contribute to their lives. You go hear their testimonies. I mean, I can stand here and tell you how wonderful I think I am, you know, for, for days and weeks and years. I, I could do that. But go and see what other people have had to say about me. You know, in that case, there's, there's an example of something different. And that, of course, is not to promote me. My purpose is to promote my God. You know, if I mean, if I wanted to promote myself, there's a lot that I could say, testimonially speaking, that would put me out on the speaking circuits that I just don't talk about. I've never spoken of because I want people to know my God for who he is and not because of me and the changes that I went through, the obstacles that I had to overcome in order to become a Christian, in order to become who I am today. You know, a lot that I just don't, I don't tell people about because I'm interested in people knowing him more than knowing me. And so I might be quite inspirational, but you know, hey, look, read through the testimonials that are on the Living God Ministries website to be encouraged and inspired to go through the testimony that I have presented that perhaps you may get to know your God more, but it's not the same, all right? There's something totally different. It's not the same as hearing this testimony or hearing these things from God himself, all right? For you to hear from him is not the same as you hearing about him from me. It's not the same. And you will definitely do so much better if you will hear these kinds of things from him. You know, on occasion, I try to encourage people, listen, this is what I believe, this is what I have said, you need to pray and ask God to testify to you, is what I have said true? All right, I have said this, is it true? And let him testify of that. Let him speak to you in a different way when it comes to these things, in a way that you could perhaps appreciate much more than the way that I presented it. You really need, if you're not already, of course, you, you really need to value and appreciate the testimony of God about himself and to really embrace that and to listen to what he may have to say to you. All right. Now, there are some issues to 
consider when it comes to what I just said. All right, the first thing you may notice, perhaps, is that he doesn't have a lot to say to you. You know, you just, you're not really hearing from God. Okay, and listen, you know, that's fine. You know, if I never hear from God ever again between now and the day that I am physically dead, I'm going to be, I'll be perfectly fine with it. You know, if I never hear from him again, you know, mainly because he's already shared with me so much, you know, that I'm very thankful for all that I have. And I have more than enough to keep me going until the end of this life that I have right now. If he doesn't want to share anything more with me, I'm perfectly fine with that. I will be thankful. And, and I will not feel as though I've been rejected or, you know, I won't feel disappointed. Those kinds of things, uh, you know, but there are, you know, there, there, there are circumstances, especially when a person is, is first growing in the faith. They first got saved, you know, they're, they're young in the faith. They're, they're not very mature. There is a deep desire to hear from God, you know, and, and that's good. Okay. And, and it should be there. A deep desire to hear from God, and yet we don't really hear from God. You know, we don't we don't really hear from Him very much. Look, I remember that. I remember when I first got saved. I didn't hear anything from the Lord. Okay, how did I personally, and I can testify of this? How did I first consider that maybe I was hearing from God, and that He was sharing things with me, and that He was showing me things about Himself? Well, for myself, this happened as I was reading through the scriptures. That's when it happened. I would read through the scriptures and I would read through a passage and somehow, all right, I would see something there that I never saw before. And I would understand it in a way that I, I know I could have never understood that and I could have never seen that unless God himself just spoke to me and said and illuminated something to me about what was said, what was written. There were just occasions like that. And I could sit there at my desk looking at the scriptures and I could just simply recognize the living God has just said something to me. You know, and I could really appreciate that. That that was a lot. Okay? So I encourage people to consider that as a beginning. You know, this was my experience. You may have something similar. Maybe you don't. All right. But I can testify of this. I can say, you know, that this is something that I personally have experienced, but I cannot teach anybody to do that. You know, what, 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 what am I going to do? Give you some uh, list of things that you can do. This is the procedure. These are the steps. And then all of a sudden, you know, God, he's going to speak. And if he doesn't, well, then, you know, there's obviously something wrong with you, you know. <laughs> You know, he, he's not obligated to reveal anything to you, all right? He's not. If he shows you something, you know, that's wonderful. But if he doesn't, you can't say that you didn't follow the steps correctly or that, you know, he didn't respond in the timing or in the way that you, you know, you, you declared that he has to, he has to speak up, you know. <laughs> we can't relate to him that way. We need to wait and be patient and be thankful, all right, for whatever he may share, whatever he may reveal. And, you know, when I would look at things like that, I would see, you know, I just know that that came from God because there's no way I would have seen that otherwise. There's just no way. Another approach that I have taken is I have asked questions. You know, when it comes to prayer, that's prayer for me. Prayer for me is asking God some questions. God, I have some questions for you. You know, that and also uh, the other thing that I tend to do is I tend to say, you know, Lord, I'm not sure if you're really aware of something. So I'm just going to let you know. You know, this is something that I would like to let you know about. I think you should be notified about this. All right. And I'm going to ask that maybe you consider participating in a solution or, you know, in some way in the lives of people considering this event and this situation. But, you know, a good thing to do is to really ask questions. And some of my favorite questions to ask the Lord, especially when I'm reading through uh, historical events in the scriptures, things that have happened. Uh, and in some cases, I will ask him about circumstances that are happening in my daily life, just right there at the moment when it comes to a person or to a situation. All right. I will just ask, the, ask this question in my heart. I will ask this question, Lord, what do you see here? You know, what do you see? 
this is what I see, but what is it that you see? You know, and, and this is what I'm hearing, but what are you hearing in this current situation? Or in times past, you know, when you read about something that was going on between God and some other people, you can ask him, what did you really see happening here? And what were you really hearing? Okay, what did you see? What did you hear? And of course, what do you think? Okay, what do you think about this? You know, about this that is happening now? What do you think about what has already happened? And just wait, you know, and be patient. And perhaps he may share something with you. If not now, maybe a little bit later. One of the biggest obstacles that that we definitely deal with, all right, that people deal with when it comes to this, especially knowing their God in terms of what does he see? What does he hear? What does he think? These are ways of getting to know him. One of the obstacles that exists is that there are things that we believe that are not true. Okay, and I mentioned this in the previous message that what we believe can tend to get in the way of what he can share. All right, it is just the way things are. You know, God does not have a communication problem. This is important to remember. Try to remember this, maybe write it down. God does not have a communication problem. All right, what he has to deal with is what are we really ready and able to hear, to see, and to know, really, okay? And it turns out that there are things that we believe that are not true, but we believe that these things are true. So if he shares something with us that's not going to fit very well with what we believe is true, this is not going to, this is not going to be productive, okay? This is not going to be useful and we will discount it. We may even think that it's the devil speaking to us when it's him. All right. There's the possibility. Now, it could be the other way around as well. So, you know, don't always assume that that could mean that God is really trying to share something with you. But what we believe will get in the way. If we believe something about him that is not true, then there will be some limits concerning what he can share uh, with, with, you know, with regards to our understanding of things just because of that. And what, you know, when we first get saved, of course, there are a lot of things that we believe that are not consistent with the truth that God has defined. It's just, they're just, that's just the way it is. You know, when a person first gets saved, they're, they're not all of a sudden perfect experts of the knowledge of good and evil, for example. No, they got a long ways to go and they know very little of anything about who their God is as a person. And so we have to grow, we have to mature, we have to experience change. All right. This is important to recognize and that this can be an obstacle and you, you just need to embrace that and recognize that and, and, and understand that your relationship with God is going to be very much defined by you discovering the truth of him, what he's done, what that implies. Okay. There are a lot of new things for you to discover and understand and you're going to need to incorporate those things into your life. And it's better to do this, of course, a little bit at a time. All right. Now, as these kinds of changes happen, change can make you feel uncomfortable. All right. Just be just discovering that there's that, that you were wrong. All right. Just discovering that you were wrong is going to be uncomfortable. It's <laughs> just that, you know, to, to realize, you know, I believe something that's just totally wrong. It, it, that's a lot of discomfort for a lot of people just getting past that. OK, if you recognize that there are things that you believe that that are not true and you correct that. That's a disruption, you know, that's going to be a big disruption in your life. And there could be some big adjustments that would be made as a result of that. And then what about other people? You know, there's going to be a tremendous amount of discomfort when other people who are close to you in your life, your, you know, your family, your friends, what about your church? Okay. You know, when you believe something different from what they believe, there's going to be a lot of discomfort. You know, there just is, you know, I can tell you uh, in my own personal life, when I believed 
that Jesus is the Messiah, when I believed that, when I asserted that, that, that belief and that conviction, you know, how did, how did other people in my life see me? Well, they saw me as someone who has embraced a lie. Okay. And well, you know, that was pretty bad. But then later, you know, years later, I started to tell other people about this. You know, I started to start to tell other people about Jesus and about the gospel. And that was, that was beyond unacceptable because from their point of view, I am telling lies. All right. From their point of view, I am being dishonest. I am being deceptive. And, oh, you know, God forbid that I'm receiving compensation for the work that I do. If I do that, well, now, you know, now I'm a scam artist of some kind, right? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm using lies and deceptions to deceive and manipulate people. And they're giving me money, you know, they're obviously being, being tricked and, and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so that's how they perceived me as someone who was, you know, on the, you know, on the edge of being a criminal, Okay, uh, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I know this might sound a little bit bizarre, but, but when I stepped forward and started telling people the truth in a, in a, in a, in a large, on a large scale, all right, um, when I started doing that, then that was a new layer of rejection, okay? Because, because it's one thing if I believe things that are not true, uh, it's another thing if I go and tell people about them, especially if these things can't even be true from these people's point of view anyway, and that I probably I'm, I probably know that I'm t telling lies, you know, that I'm intentionally being dishonest. That's that's the perception that other people had and still have of me. All right, that I'm intentionally a dishonest, manipulative person in other people's lives. You know, and it's just, that's just not the case, not even remotely. You know, I mean, I, I, I do this out of my absolute conviction. I really do. And I have given up a lot, uh, given up on a lot of opportunity, given up many opportunities that I could have certainly done much better at if you wanted to look at it from a material point of view in the world. Uh, absolutely much, much better than, than, than what I have experienced. So, you know, that certainly is not a motive. OK, but you're going to have to realize that you yourself are going to have to deal with the discomfort of admitting that you were wrong. And you're going to have to deal with the discomfort of other people claiming that you are wrong. <laughs> you are wrong now when you embrace these kinds of things. And that's that's a struggle. You know, that's a struggle and it will get in the way. It will get in the way of you embracing the truth of God. So what is he going to say to you? You know, I mean, what's he going to say, especially at these critical moments? Is he going to say, OK, you know, you want to you, you want your relationship with others more than you want it with him? So be it. That's your choice. You know, that's your decision. And he will not invade upon that, you know, not in the way that's overcoming, you know, that's overcoming your will. Or, or, or threatening you in a way that, that you're going to do it out of fear, okay? He doesn't need people in his life like that. He wants people in his life. He wants people to know who he is because we really want to, all right? So um, let me check my notes here. Um, he doesn't have a communication problem. You will enter into a tremendous amount of discomfort. Um, that's... That's where I'm going to pause. All right. I'm going to pause on that for verse 17. Let me move forward into verse 18. Ephesians chapter one, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Okay. Now I've got three different topics here, three different ones. I've got what is the exceeding, I'm sorry, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, all right, the enlightenment there, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. So we have the enlightenment, we have the hope of his calling, and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance? Let me start with that one, the one at the end, and I'll work my way backwards. All right, his inheritance 
in the saints. I'm not going to talk about this one in this message. I'll, I'll bring this up in the next one. His inheritance in the saints. This is different from our inheritance in Christ. All right, I've spoken a lot about this in, from the previous passages. We have received an inheritance in Christ as a result of his death. But here he says that God himself has also received an inheritance as a result of his death. Okay, this is, this is a different concept, something that I will speak about in the next message. All right, so let me, let me come back to that one later. Going backwards to the beginning of verse 18, I'm going to talk about the hope of his calling, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. All right, now this is kind of a tough one for a lot of people because when they think about his calling, all right, his calling in your life, you know, what is, what is God calling you to do is what people are usually thinking. They're usually thinking that the call of God is for you to go and do something for him. What is the hope of his calling? Well, that would be related to what kinds of works he might prepare for you to do, you specifically, all right, and that you are to discover what is the hope of this calling that he has for you individually. Is what people are usually thinking of when they read this passage. All right, I do not see that. I see something different, okay? I do believe that he can do that, like, I, you know, as I just described, that he may prepare works for us to do, and on an individual basis, he may send us to do these kinds of, these kinds of works, like what I'm doing right now. You know, I do believe that God has sent me to do this, but that's the key word, it's sent. To be called is something separate. The call is to Christ, okay? The call is is to him the hope of the calling let's start, first start with what the call is and then see what the hope is the call is to your god he calls out into the world come to me that's the call okay the call is to god it is to christ it is to him that is the call. He calls out to the world and says, is there anyone out there who is interested in me? Okay. We are to go to him. That is the call. The call is always to Christ. Now, as we grow and mature and as he sees fit, he will send us to participate in the work that he is doing. Or maybe he won't. You know, if he doesn't send you, then don't feel like you're left out or something. It just means that he just doesn't have anything for you to do right now. That doesn't mean there is nothing to do. You can go and decide to go do something yourself. And you know, he will go with you. All right? So if you do not feel that he has specifically sent you to go and do something on his behalf, you have been granted the privilege to go and do whatever you would like, and he will go along with you. All right, really? You know, I can say with great conviction that he sent me in order to do the ministry that I have done in the years past, the ministry that I'm doing right now, and I have a suspicion that he would like me to do certain things that are not related to what I'm doing right now, but that he would like me to do certain things in the future that I'm preparing to do. Some of which I might do, whether he has specifically related to me that it is what he wants me to do. If, 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 he, if he hasn't, you know, I might do those things anyway, just because I really want to do those things. And I, I won't feel ashamed before God said, well, you know what, Lord, this is what I would like to do. And if there's something else that you just, you really want me to do in this case, I might ask you to find somebody else to do it. You know, I might do that. And I believe that he will accept that. You know, I do. There was an occasion in times past when he, he asked me to do something and I said, no, of course I ended up doing it anyway, but you know, <laughs> All right. It just it was just delayed a little bit, but I did it, you know, okay, all right, fine, I'll do it. But, um, you know, there may be the occasion in the future when I don't. 
And, and I won't be ashamed of that because I have that kind of confidence in terms of my relationship with him and who we are together. All right. But the calling is always to him first. And then he sends us out to participate in his purposes. Okay. Now, another way to view this is to look at the world and to see that there are many needs in the world. You know, there are many needs. There are many opportunities to reach out to others with the love of God. All right. But if you were to look at all of these needs and if you were to look at all of these opportunities, you could get a little frustrated really fast. You could get frustrated not knowing which one of these needs are your call. You know, because you see them all, you see all these wonderful opportunities, but, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that God is calling you, if I was to use that expression, which I think it's better to say, it doesn't mean that God is sending you to go and meet those needs. You're never going to know that unless you are first, you are first called to him and you are resting in him. And you have grown to know his voice so that you know when he speaks to you and that that specific voice, whatever that is, that you just know in the core of your spirit because you have heard it many times as he has illuminated the truth to you before. You know, you will recognize that after a period of time and say, well, you know, this is something that he is sending me to go do. And, you know, when you are sent to fulfill an opportunity or to meet a need, then it, it won't matter what the outcome is. All right. It's not going to matter if anybody listens to you, if anyone responds, if anyone turns to God. None of that will have any relevance whatsoever. The only thing that will have relevance is that God sent you and you went. And if you went, then you're put. And even if the situation may get to be so dire, may, may get to be so bad that you physically die, you know, you're murdered or something in that kind of a circumstance, you can do so with confidence, with thankfulness, and with praise because you know who sent you and you know who put you and you know that the outcome is not your concern. What your concern is, is that you are participating with God in a way that he has asked you to do, to do so. All right. So this is something that I want to mention as, as we approach this verse, that there is a big difference between being called and being sent. And, and it's really helpful to be able to distinguish between the two. In this case, you are called to Christ. So what is the hope of his calling, all right? The hope is not about whatever outcome may be of how you may change the world, all right? The, the hope is related to the calling. It's related to the calling. You are called to him, why? So that you may know him, all right? The hope of his calling is that you'll know, you know, you'll know your God. That's the connection between verse 17 and verse 18, what, that you may know the hope of his calling. You may know the person of your God, right? At the end of verse 17, give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Verse 18, in the middle of it, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, that you may know what is the hope. What is the hope? that you may know him, all right? He has called you to him that you may know him. That's what he says, okay? So again, in verse 17 and 18, let me read through this and see if you can capture what I'm describing here, that the hope of the calling is knowing him. That's what he's praying for, that you might know him more, that he has called you to know him, and the hope is, is that you will, all right? Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, which is an example of what you may know about him. 
all right? Which means you you're gonna you're gonna find out about what he gets out of all this, you know, and what does he get? All we're thinking about in most cases is what we're gonna get. What about what God gets? Okay? So that's that's what I wanted to introduce you to concerning verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. All right, now this is another layer. The eyes of your understanding might be enlightened to the hope of his calling, enlightened to the knowing of your God that you have been called to. All right, we could just go with that. That's a simple way of addressing the beginning of verse 18. Okay, now what are some of these things that we may have hope in in terms of our enlightenment that he would reveal to us that we could appreciate? Okay, I can talk with you about what what he appreciates, what is the hope of his calling that you may know who he is. And here's an example, something that he gets out of this relationship. But there are things that we may know in addition to that as part of our eyes being enlightened. Okay, one of the things that I like to think of is that we will have a place with him. All right, we can know with great confidence that we will have a place with him. And this can give us great hope concerning our future. You know, that this is something that we can see in in a bigger way and that we can know in a more personal way. All right, he will show us who he is and more importantly, that what I have and what I know is enough. Okay, so as it relates to our eyes being enlightened, that these are things that we can have hope in for ourselves, that we can have hope that we will know enough. Okay, we will have hope that we will know him and know him enough. And we can have hope that we will have a place with him in all eternity. Okay, so this is kind of going backwards into the beginning of verse 18. But I, I just, I think that this, uh, this verse would be better understood in that way. Okay, so I'm going to pause here. All right, this is a good place to pause before I get into the end of verse 18 in the next message. For those of you who are using this for your small groups, I got a question for you that you might consider using to facilitate some conversation. Uh, what is something that you changed about your beliefs recently? You know, that's a that's an interesting question. You know, uh, considering what you believe, your beliefs, what are some things that you may have changed recently? Now, for someone like myself, nothing recent at all, you know, but uh, but there are a lot of things that I have discovered recently. There are some things that I have learned recently that have not been a change of beliefs, but have added to my beliefs. So uh, this is a reasonable question to consider some discussion and can facilitate some conversation of the beliefs that you have. What are some that you feel have kind of changed a little bit recently? And if you don't have any of those that you could speak about, then what are some of the things that you have learned recently that you didn't know or understand before? Okay, and I will continue in to the end of verse 18 and beyond in the next message. Thanks.